Well, thank you. That was a uh, our first session, MJ. What you think? How'd you it feel about awesome, that? Awesome, man. That was, was good. Uh, I, I got about 20 text messages from people throughout the state. Uh, the fact that they were able to hold seven to 800 people on uh, throughout the entire conversation, I thought was just absolutely amazing. And then it was just such a rich, healthy, constructive conversation I think we need to have. It was amazing. Yeah, and I'm excited about this panel. One, because it's the panel, it's just almost, you never, you never, never, never folks, you never like these folks on a panel together. So that's rare that you do that. Um, but two, I think the issue is, so right now I was explaining earlier that sometimes we talk about uh, black empowerment or we talk about what's going on in the community and social justice, but we don't talk about it from the angle of what's going on in black empowerment, black wealth, uh, how to move up social mobility in corporate America and how that fits into what we're trying to do as a black community. Also the things, the struggles that black folks have in those areas. So I'm glad to have this panel. Uh, I want to first bring in Talisa Yancey, uh, who works at American Family. Uh, this woman is a powerhouse on her own. Uh, she has done everything possible. She's been on Ebony Magazine, Savoy Magazine. I mean, Talisa has done everything. And so thank you, uh, Ms. Yancey, for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. And, and next, I want to bring in Mr. Corey Nettles. Uh, I'm smiling because Corey and I go way, way back. Uh, when we were only, when I, I used to be the vice president of the Chamber of Commerce, he was the Wisconsin uh, Secretary of Commerce, Secretary of uh, State Commerce, and we used to be the only two black men in all white rooms, and this is true story. And uh, Corey has moved up quickly, he's has some ownership in the Bucks, uh, and Corey has done a lot of different things in the community. Uh, and thank you, Corey, for joining us. Thank you for your time. I know you're busy, so we appreciate you joining us. No, thanks for including me. Looking forward to the conversation. Yes. And Mr. Cedric Ellis uh, is someone works at CUNA, who is has a very unique perspective uh, because he's not from he's not from this area. Uh, he's moved in here. He's been at CUNA there for 15, 15 years. And Cedric, let me tell you right now, Cedric is one of the realest brothers y'all going to meet. And he's, he's in corporate America, and uh, he speaks his truth. He advocates for us. And so this is a wonderful. I'm I'm honestly. I'm honored that y'all would join us because it's a busy time for all of you. So thank you for your time and uh, we, we appreciate it. MJ, right. I'll let you start with the first question. Oh, first, and also uh, YouTube, if you want more of our real talk, we'll be on YouTube, go to our podcast if you want more information. And if you want to go see these wonderful people's bios, go to Master 365 uh, Racial Summit and you'll see their bios. Well, I'll let you start, MJ. Let me, let me just say, I've followed you all over the years. Um, you all are a, um, a, a great representation of what black leadership looks like. And uh, we are so thankful um, to have you um, on this panel uh, this morning. So I wanna just get right into it. And I'm gonna start with the, the smartest person in the room with Talisa. And, uh, and, and, <laughs> and I wanna ask, um, you know, what, what did it take? Uh, tell us about your career journey what has uh, it been like to be an African-American leader working in the C-suite? And how did you uh, create change uh, within your organization? Well, thank you for calling me the smartest person in the room. I knew, I hope my husband was listening to that. <laughs> um, but, um, so first off, I'm <clears throat> incredibly grateful to be a part of this panel and with uh, the other esteemed folks that are on this call and on the ones who before. Um, my career journey is no different than most people that are sitting on this call and perhaps in the audience as well. I am the product of two African-American parents <clears throat> from the South who made the great migration to Chicago. And between my parents and my grandparents and my family at large, we have been taught that the great equalizer for us would be education. So between educating yourself and taking advantage of those opportunities, I ended up in corporate America working for um, Ford Motor Company, then Burger King, a bit of consultant, and then here um, at the greatest of those brands at American Family Insurance, where I started, not in the C-suite, I started as the advertising director uh, here for American Family Insurance. And so the formula for success, I think, is different from all of us, um, but I think um, having the conversation here today, given what we are facing, 
um, a, a better way to think about it is what does it take, not just from you, because African-American women are the most educated population in the United States of America, more degrees than anybody else. Yet we do not see a broad number of African-American women or men at the top of the corporations that we spend a great deal of money in as people of color, um, as, as a subsegment of our larger society. So what does it take? It takes your own determination, hard work. It used to take a stiff upper lip over the last couple of days or week this past week. Um, and I would say across my career at American Family, I've been challenged to not have my lip so stiff, but to speak truth to the people that I sit in the rooms with about what does it mean to actually be a woman of color in corporate America or to be a woman of color in America, or honestly, to be a woman who loves black men in America, mm -hmm. um, because I've got a husband and some brothers and some uncles and an eight year old son. So my journey is like anybody else's journey. And it indeed requires our own stamina, our own community, and quite frankly, some allies, some people who know um, what it is that you do differently that nobody else has to do. And then gives you the liberty to do it and refuses to allow you to settle. And that is what I have had across most of my career but most importantly, in my journey here in Wisconsin with American Family Insurance, with um, Jack and Bill and a bunch of other people who have been allies from the start. I love it. Very, very powerful. Uh, so whoever's the uh, best looking guy can go first between Corey and Cedric. I concede the point to Cedric. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Thank you very much. So, um, you know, like Talisa, I, um, I come from um, two African-American parents um, who migrated to Connecticut uh, from Virginia. Um, and, and candidly, uh, part of my story that might be a little different, um, you know, my parents could not read. Um, my parents worked the plantations in Virginia, the cotton fields, the, the peanut plantations, um, and moved to the north in, in search of better opportunity, uh, you know, frankly, in manufacturing. Um, my parents also did not see a path for uh, education um, for any of us. I have six sisters and four brothers. Um, I am the only college grad. Um, and the thing that was, I guess, pretty poignant for me was I had amazing mentors. Um, you know, my parents were incredibly hardworking people. Um, um, but I also had amazing, strong Black women um, who really helped me figure out the importance of education, um, and then you know, prop me up uh, to make sure that I went after it. Um, I started out my career as a school teacher. Um, that didn't last very long, largely because of my mouth um, and disagreeing with parents. So that's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, I, I then decided that um, I needed to make a path um, into the private sector I worked for Aetna for 15 years. Um, I worked for Fireman's Fund. I worked for Quest Diagnostics. And, um, and I also worked uh, for Wachovia, which is now Wells Fargo. Um, but I landed uh, 15 years ago um, at CUNY Mutual, um, not in the C-suite, but um, started working with a guy named Bob Trunzo, who was at that time the head of sales. Um, and I remember some of my early discussions with him were like, where are the black people? <laughs> CUNY Mutual had about you know, 6,000 employees at that time. And I would walk in the halls in Middleton, in uh, Madison, sorry, and not see anybody that looked like me. Um, and it was you know, puzzling and concerning to Bob as well. Um, but we had a different CEO at that time who had moved to uh, Wisconsin from the Bay Area. So 
and, and, and if you know anything about California, kind of diversity will happen. Um, and didn't think that we needed to have a real focus on it. So Talisa talked about, you know, that allyship. Um, I would say that Bob was has been an ally from day one. Um, when he became CEO, one of the very first things that he did was he added a corporate value um, for diversity and inclusion. Um, and that really began to shift how CUNY Mutual approached uh, our workplace, our marketplace, and the community. And really, it was building that um, collaboration with him um, and, and frankly, seizing the opportunity to one, speak my truth, own my truth, and to be really clear with CUNY Mutual about where I saw uh, huge challenges for us to show up right and be right. Um, we have a long way to go. I mean, we're, we are no, nowhere near there, um, but we are making incredible strides along our journey. Um, just yesterday, we had a pretty intense uh, discussion with about 250 of leaders across CUNY Mutual around the issue of race um, and, and racism um, and, and talking about what do we need to do as a company to help create um, an anti-racial, um, an anti-racist uh, culture, both inside CUNY Mutual and the society that we live in. Um, and Bob challenged every single one of our leaders uh, to really take on a personal challenge to decide what's important for them to, to move that forward. So it is about building that allyship and getting the allies to talk about it as well, but also seizing the opportunity uh, to really try to have impact where I can and all the areas that report up to me, calling out, um, things as I see them, but also helping the company figure out what's the path to make it better. Awesome. Great stuff, man. How about right, you, Mr. Board. Nettles? You know, I certainly um, agree with the uh, remarks that were, were made and uh, I won't, I don't want to be too duplicative. So I'll try to highlight a couple of things, you know, certainly I was born and raised in Milwaukee, you know, single teen mother, you know, and all that sort of thing, uh, an extended family and village that loved me and nurtured me and encouraged me and pushed me and, you know, a first generational everything like, you know, the other folks uh, who were speaking earlier. Uh, so I, that all that whole story, you know, resonates with me. I uh, began my uh, career as a corporate lawyer at Crawls and Brady in Milwaukee. Uh, Jim Doyle ran for pres uh, for governor and dragged me into his cabinet and and after I came out of that, I decided to uh, take a turn into entrepreneurship instead of into corporate America uh, as an executive. And I, I really wrestled with that. And um, I decided that my passion, you know, certainly after being Commerce Secretary, but over my life, my passion had really been you know, entrepreneurship. And one of the things I, I picked up from my young mother, she was always on her hustle. You know, she was constantly reinventing herself and remaking herself and, and was herself a, an entrepreneur of sorts. So... Um, so I decided to go that that route, the entrepreneurial route, and, and spend my time today running a uh, a private equity fund based in in Milwaukee. Um, so that that's been the journey. Um, the, the bit of the story that resonates with me um, that's very similar to both Talisa and to Cedric is this whole thing about you know guardian angels, mentors, allies, whatever you want to call them. And you know I've been blessed all along my entire life with just a phenomenal. Uh, support system of guardian angels. And, you know, like Talisa and Cedric, I'm sure I get dragged out to, you know, some of these, you know, affinity group, you know, speaking things about how do you be successful. And I have this one speech that I do about the importance of being helpable and how do you ask for and receive and act on help. And when I'm doing that talk, I always that the help comes from sometimes, you know, unlikely suspects. And, you know, everybody wants to find a black female mentor if you're a black woman or a black male. And and that's fine. And I've had some phenomenal black men, you know, mentors and role models. But I've had old white guys and old Jewish guys and white women and black women and everybody in between. 
And I think you ought to be at a place in your spirit where you say to the universe that you're willing to ask for and to receive help. And, and there are a lot of people out there who are willing to stand in the gap and to do that, particularly for those of us who don't have, you know, a long pedigree and a lot of resources. And we're not, you know, I use Jay Winthrop the third as my um, whipping boy in a lot of my speeches. You know, I don't have that kind of pedigree. So, you know, that whole thing about advocacy and, and allies, I think, is important. The other thing that I'd say that, you know, why I chose to take the turn into personally into entrepreneurship, and even to my friends in corporate America, my wife's a corporate executive, she's in a global role at Manpower Group, and before that had a global role at Molson Coors. You know, I, I talk to, to minorities and women about risk taking. And certainly as an entrepreneur, I take risk. But even in corporate America, you got to take risk. You got to take risk with your career, calculated risk. I'm not saying be stupid. You know, you got to take risks in your career. Um, and we have to, you know, as, as folks get comfortable with risk. I mean, everything we gain, we hold to so tightly because we know the fragility and, and how this stuff can all slip away from us real quickly because we are more vulnerable than Jay Winthrop III or than Becky. But we can't allow that to, uh, to keep us from taking you know, measured and calculated risks. And, you know, certainly as I think about the events over the last week or two, it's pushing me to even think more broadly and expansively about what additional risks I need to be taking. So, you know, that risk component, I think, is a real important part of, of our, of, uh, certainly of my story, but I think it's a part of our success. Uh, one of my early mentors when I was in college was the first rich Black man that I knew to be a rich Black man. Uh, his name was Harold Jordan. I was at Lawrence University. He was a Lawrence alum. He was chair of the board. And I was on my way off to a, a fellowship in, in South Africa. My, my mom was scared to death about me going to South Africa. And, and Harold said, you know, they got bigger fish to fry. That was one thing. <laughs> so she needn't worry about me. But the other thing that he really taught me about my career is he said, you, you realize at some point that you're smart enough that you're never going to starve. And, and I always say to my wife, who, you know, came a notch or two up the social order than I did, I know how to be poor. I know how to do that. So if the worst thing that ever happens to me is I fall backwards, you know, it's never going to be as bad as it used to be. So that frees me up to take some risks in my career and how I spend my political, social and financial capital now in trying to make change about that risk taking thing. So that's been a seminal part of, of my story and of my journey. You know, you guys, you guys have themes, what you're saying. But first off, Talisa, make sure you tell Jack we said what's up. We love having him on Real Talk. Tell him we, we love to have him on here. Tell him, don't be scared. We love him. And tell, tell say Cedric, tell Bob the same thing. Tell him, don't be scared. We <laughs> love him here. Put him on Real Talk. Tell him Absolutely. we love you. We love, love for him. is not scared at all. <laughs> <laughs> so probably, she said, year, let me let it be known. <laughs> and probably right now, in, in all honesty, I'm, uh, it's a little bit of levity. Probably right now, I would imagine that Jack and Bob or whoever, but for sure I know Jack because I've been in two meetings this week with him. I, I might be three. I'm losing track. Specifically talking about the issues that are facing our country yeah. and specifically talking about how can we do more yeah. and, and specifically pushing me when I said we can do this, 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 this and that. And I'm thinking I got a good list quite frankly, <laughs> along with um, all of the, my, my peers. And, and he goes, but I think we should be doing more. So hey, you might Talisa, want to think about pulling that CEO group together. We, 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 we're going to announce something like that coming soon. I don't want to talk about that, but that's, that's coming. That's coming. But hey, Talisa, and for Jack and Bob, I want you to know this for real. Talisa speaks so highly of Jack and behind the scenes, just like when white folks, we leave the room, y'all talk to each other, black folks talk to each other too. And I'm telling yeah. you right now, uh, Talisa speaks highly of Jack behind the scenes, and so does Cedric. Cedric talks, when me and him met, he spoke so highly of Bob, and I'm bringing that up because it's important that it shows that you have access to leadership and leadership matters and how you are influencing what you're doing, which leads me to my question, how do you make change in the organizations that you're in, and how do you know when it's meaningful? Like, how do you, because corporations like governments, like a lot of ways, it's all bureaucracy, so how do you make meaningful change? I'll start with you, Talisa. You keep putting me on the, on the stand first. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just going in order. Corey went first. I'm coming back. Um, I, I would say it in three different in three different chapters. One of them is what do you do personally? And what and, and then second is what does the corporation do? And the third one is one that I like to call what is our responsibility above and beyond the job that you have in corporate America as the person who has a seat at the table. 
So personally, obviously, representation matters. Uh, pr uh, proximity matters. Um, for the young people coming behind me or the people of color who've already always been there to see Cedric move from one, one chair to the next chair or me to the one chair to the next chair, it matters that I look like them. It matters that they see that people are embracing me, not because of my race, but definitely not excluding me because of my race and allowing my work to stand up and speak for itself as well. The, in addition to that is who's on your team. And I, and I wanna be truthful to us as African-American people on the call in corporate America, sometimes we worry about putting only the most qualified, only the most pedigree, been through all the hoops, sat in all the chairs people, because we know as, as we said earlier, how fragile these roles could be for us for no other reason other than you run into the wrong person who's got some issues around what you look like and how we fit into our larger society. Mm -hmm. And it takes us to sort of reframe our own mind to say, we don't have to be harder on ourselves than we already are because they're not gonna be that hard, um, that hard on, on us either. And one of my favorite uh, moments with um, our president, Bill Westrake, because I was in the process of talking about some people for a job and I was evaluating the people and they were a very diverse slate. American Family does a great job of saying um, you need a diverse slate. And I, of course, I'm like, of course, I don't want to start the interviews until I have a diverse slate. And when we were going through the candidates, particularly, there was a person he asked me about. And I went into the story about why that person, why I thought they were good, but I was worried about X, Y, and Z that they didn't have. And then he asked why. And I said, well, because they're Black. And we always have to be more qualified more educated, work harder, longer, blah, blah, blah. And he said, but you sit in this chair now, Talisa, and I'm your boss. So if we say that we're going to give them a shot and allow them to interview, why, why can't we do it? And that was the first time that I actually had to check myself about the standards we put on each other. Because again, we've challenged our, our parents, um, whether they're you have two parents or one parent, but you got a community around you. We challenge ourselves to not complain, but to work harder, be better, out-educate, outsmart, outwork, come in early, stay late. And so we sort of created this narrative for ourselves about acceptability so that we give ourselves the best chance for success. And I think part of what is required of us right now is to, is to check our own selves and, and to extend some grace to ourselves and our experience, but also to other people that look like us. On the company side, the most important thing, and you start, started off saying it earlier, Henry, that any company can do is to extend economic opportunity and extend that economic opportunity um, in mass to everyone and, and, and check your processes and systems to make sure that you are not inadvertently, I'm sure people are not doing this on purpose, inadvertently excluding whole groups of population and be very intentional about, and we're trying very hard at American Family, we're being challenged to try very hard to find the best talent and don't even, so this is not about giving people um, something that they don't deserve, but it's about extending your network to go and get people the opportunities that have been afforded to me and all these people on this call and to be very intentional about it. And in Wisconsin, we gotta be intentional about it because of the, just the way our society is set up here in Wisconsin and where people are located. So how do you, through internships, through exposure to kids in high school, um, through programs with colleges and universities and perhaps other organizations, how do you make sure that you inside the company give your employees, both black, white, and otherwise, the opportunity to live up to the highest ideals of your company, but most importantly, the country? And so I, I'll say this before I stop talking, a third of our time in America is spent at work. So if the corporations get it right, I got a good feeling that the society can follow along. A lot of our institutions, our trust in institutions were to government and state and local government and the federal government. And I'm not saying I'm giving up hope on them, but I am saying that if the corporations decide, and we have decided at American Family, that we can craft and create an environment for our people to have exposure on both sides to the truest meaning of what we said our founding fathers 
said they thought America was supposed to be. They had some flaws in their logic at first, but eventually we keep pushing toward this narrative that it is about hard work, determination, and equal access and opportunity for everybody. And if that is the highest ideal of who we are as a country, the people who have the best chance of doing it will be corporations, in my opinion. And I'll stop. I love it. I love Thank you. And Cedric, can you answer the same question for us? How you how do you how do you know a meaningful change in your organization? How does that happen? And you know, how how do you make that happen? Then how do you know it's happening? So candidly, when I first um kind of gotten what I would call a, a pretty senior um, role at uh, Kenya Mutual. I used to be the head of HR. Mm. And there is, I'm going to call it as I see it, there is power in that role. Um, and being aligned with the CEO who was really committed to bring about change kind of gave me license to really begin to test some of those things that Talisa just spoke about. What are our policies and practices that prevent us from tapping into the broader base? Um, you know, what are we doing in terms of looking at other, uh, we're not going to the usual places that we always go to, UW Madison, the UW system. Um, how do we go beyond that if we really want to make sure that we're inviting everyone to compete um, at our table? So what, so what I did um, was really took the license to begin to test and challenge some of the things that we put in place, but I also used our own words against us. Um, you know, we have a set of values and every single time um, that, you know, policy decisions are being made, approaches are being made, I always force us to go back there. Now, you know, are we honoring these values? You know, are we are we extending a wide enough net to make sure that we're being inclusive? Um, who's at the table? Uh, so I've been really intentional um, about uh, speaking truth. You know, speaking truth to power, really calling um, the organization on it, um, but also um, in a quiet way, reaching into other senior leaders in the organization to get their allyship to get them to speak up more, to get them to take action. Um, you know, one of the things that, that uh, you know, uh, Talisa, it's really interesting. Angela Russell and I literally just had this conversation about um, that measuring stick that we put up against people of color and how do we make sure that we aren't part of that challenge? How do we make sure that we support um, and, you know, that we make sure that we're creating the, the, the best type of environment for anybody that looks like us to be successful. So it really forces us um, to really check ourselves. Um, but also, I'm gonna tell you, I've had to have some really tough uncle discussions with some of our employees to say, you know what, time out. You can't do that. You, you can't show up and expect that somebody's gonna trust you if you're saying X, Y, and I mean, I've had to have that kind of realness. Um, and, you know, just as Corey said earlier, one of the things that has given me a bit of freedom is, you know, financial privilege. Um, I wasn't always there. I mean, I, I grew up in the projects and we lived off of food stamps. Um, but today I'm in a different place. I don't want to go back there. But if I had to, I can open a can of pork and beans just as I used to. So it, it gave me a ton of freedom to make sure that I'm actually working from within and you know, with some of the things that I've been involved in within Wisconsin, whether it's the governor's task force on workforce investment, to be able to call it, to be able to say time out. I mean, I remember I sat in a room one time in Wisconsin on the governor's task force and I watched a video where they were promoting Wisconsin. I know what video you're talking about too. I know what video you're talking about too. With the guy polka dancing and stuff. Yes. <laughs> And I almost lost it. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> because there was no people of color. Well, there was one. There was one, one, one black guy for a second. <laughs> there was no, none of the indigenous people of Wisconsin. I mean, what? Yeah. And I was like, you know what? You guys are missing it. But being able to, to, to call it um, and push the envelope, um, yeah, I, you know, 
some of it you it is risk taking, but I also had you know got to this place where, yes, I, I I know I'm in a privileged financial position. I also am really comfortable about being poor again. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm making sure that the organization, the society, continues to not see it as a them problem, but it's us. Um, so, so, so one of the things that I've been trying to do within Community Mutual is making sure that that is part of the language that we're always asking people, what are they doing to help us advance? Um, and that it's not, you know, people of color um, things to do. Um, so I've continued to push that messaging. I've continued to kind of test and challenge our policies, our practices, our programs. You know, what are we doing to make sure that we're not putting in place obstacles and that we're, te we're tearing down other obstacles and things that might be in the way of our being a more inclusive environment. And Corey, I want to come to you because, you know, it's a little different for you because you're the CEO of your organization, but how do you still, how do you still recognize that you are making change and the change that you want to make, uh, especially for people of color? And you know, I, I certainly agree with everything that Talisa and Cedric have said. And so I really like, you know, batting cleanup behind the two of them because it makes my, my job real easy here today. Uh, so I agree with everything they've said. The only, only thing I would, um, I would add or amplify on this change thing is, um, you know, my, my mantra is if you don't measure it, it doesn't count. And I think, you know, if, if we're pushing for change in our organizations and in the organizations where we are influencing things, you know, you got to have measurements to hold yourself accountable and to hold your organization accountable. And I can't tell you how much time at my organization or on other places where I'm the board chair, we got all these values, we got all these, you know, mission statements and all this sort of stuff. And it's all like mom and apple pie, like who can be against it? But you look, you look three, five, 10 years later, and you have to say, okay, what has actually changed? So, so much of my conversation is also around what are the metrics by which we can hold ourselves accountable and say that we have made change over this period of time? And we're going to talk about those metrics internally. We're going to project them out publicly into the world so that they know what we're holding ourselves accountable to. And, you know, this whole thing, this change journey, this change thing is a journey. It's not a destination, right? I've been in organizations that had major diversity goals that hit them was very self-congratulatory and five years later, like you, it's like a rubber band, you pull it and it pulls back and our numbers like plummet to zero. So you're never really done. So I think the other thing about this change thing is to move beyond the kind of altruistic normative statements about who we are and what we believe in. And so, okay, then what is the proof of that? What is the manifestation of that? Does our employee base look differently? Is there a gap in wages for minority women or women or minority people. You know, I happen to be CEO of my business. The next, you know, I, I got a, a white woman who's here, who's my office manager, administrator. I have a, and a young African-American male here who's the analyst, but in between they're like white men, right? So how do we make sure that all across our organization that the change shows up and not just that, you know, I'm not just a figurehead of it because I'm the black guy who owns the business, but it's got to, you know, I got to be held accountable too, internally and externally in my organization and the other ones where I show up. So, so Corey, let me ask, um, and we'll just start with, you know, work our way back so we don't have to Lisa go uh, first. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, so tell us, you know, as a, as a CEO or as the leaders of your departments, uh, what keep you up at night? And if you could tie what keep you up at night around racial injustices. So we've gotten a couple of those questions on social media and would like for you to respond to that. Yeah, I think what keeps me up at night is, you know, how do I continue to have this business be successful and have it kind of be here, right? I'm not CUNA, I'm not American family, you know, I'm like two men in a truck. So like, how do I make payroll? How do I make sure that, you know, we're 13, 14 years old, you know, and I still feel like a startup. So, so much of what keeps me up at night is, you know, how do we be successful? How are we successful comes back to the human capital. I mean, I'm a human capital business. I mean, we sell, you know, intellectual capital. Uh, and that means I got to have the right team that can really execute in a way that differentiates us and our performance against our peer groups. Uh, so that that certainly keeps me up. And then I'm, my, you know, my, my business model is a double bottom line business model. 
So, you know, we have to make a market rate of return on capital for our investors, but we also are a mission oriented organization. And I tell my investors, in addition to generating financial return, I will generate social return. So that puts me right in that social justice equity kind of conversation as part of as a, as a critical component and differentiator, you know, in my business. Um, the other way this conversation shows up for me is, you know, as grandmama who raised me for my first several years taught me, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. And I've been blessed with a phenomenal platform and a lot of resources. So I got to figure out when I look out my window here and I see the Calatrava and the lake and, and all this good stuff, you know, those protesters are marching down the street. So like, what's my role in supporting that work? And my day began with me on the phone with the CEO of a large national community foundation, you know, talking about moving from this kind of incremental, moderate conversation to something that's much more radical and the fierce urgency of now. Uh, so all of that is connected to my work. And when we're in these kinds of positions, we have to continue to make sure the business is successful. But then we have to use that that human capital and that financial capital to drive social change, which is good for the business. I've been a policyholder of American Family for almost 25 years. They need me to be successful uh, as a customer and as a black customer so that they can continue to do what they do. So these things are, for me, you know, inextricably intertwined. And we can't have a successful economy if we're leaving, you know, we've got African-American unemployment today is at the adult unemployment is at 50%. This country can't be successful with 50% African-American unemployment. So for me, all of these things are connected and, and th those are the things that are keeping me up. Yeah. Cedric, uh, do you want to take that question? Yeah. So I need to, I need to clarify something because this Angela Russell, sent me a, a, text. a text message. <laughs> <laughs> Angela said, did you just say uncle? <laughs> uh, she said, you better be clear that you ain't saying Uncle Tom. Uh, so let me be really clear. The kinds of discussions I'm talking about, you know, those kinds of discussions that you take people who are younger than you, yeah. um, that you have to give that mentoring discussion to, to make sure that they're showing up excellent, period, in the story. Um, because that's what, at the end of the day, success is about. Now, I don't do everything perfect. I don't expect everybody to, and but they can You can show up better, and and we need to be able to have that tough discussion. Well, let me tell you what keeps me up. Um, and candidly, the demographics of the world are changing. Mm -hmm. um, and if you break that down to the implications within the United States. If we don't start paying attention to what is it going to take for us to be successful, we have to make sure that we're changing um, the culture, that we're building the most inclusive cultures, that we're creating opportunities for everyone to be successful, no matter what walk of life you come from. That's what keeps me up. That's what keeps me concerned because your customers are asking the question. Your customers are looking at what you're doing. Your customers, when they're calling you, they wanna, they wanna see and hear people that look and sound like them, not something else. Um, Cause they'll, they can, you know, people speak with their checkbook, they'll go someplace else. So making sure that we as a company um, at Kuna Mutual are really um, well situated to be able to deal with that and also be a winner in winning the future around, you know, what's the world, what's the world going to be? What's the U.S. going to be? And who are our customers? And are we listening? Are we, are, do we have them at the table is what keeps me up. Um, so trying to create that culture that really enables that. Now you, now you got um, the floor to Lisa. <laughs> everything they just said. Um, um, so I would say, um, Take, putting aside the business realities that all businesses in order to make an impact in the world must be successful. So obviously that stays on everybody's mind. Um, if you put that aside, the thing that keeps me up at night is uh, something that Corey said, which is the fierce urgency of now. And can we move with enough speed and agility in partnership within your companies and outside of our companies with communities, 
with colleges perhaps, sometimes even with local governments if that's necessary. Um, what can we, can we move with enough speed and agility to capture this moment so that this becomes the worst moment we see going forward? We've seen a lot of stuff in the last um, 10, 15 years, um, probably more than we would have seen before because of the advent of smartphones and a camera in everybody's pocket and in everybody's hand. But I would say that what we've seen over the last week and two weeks, going into two weeks, has been um, shocking for some people, probably not for us on this phone call because we expect such. We hope, for, we hope that it doesn't happen, but we're not shocked. But there are a lot of well-meaning people who don't look like us that are shocked. And they're shocked in the same way that people were shocked when they saw what was happening in Selma more than 50 years ago. And what they did immediately after there is that created a burning platform for people to work together, for people to get out of their houses in New York, turn off their TVs and go down to Alabama. And what I, what I hope, what keeps me up is how does this moment becomes that moment for this generation? When I was younger, I used to write poetry a lot. My mama made me stop to go to get a real job, she said. But anyway, I know she's watching this, so I want her to feel something. But anyway. Be careful now, be careful. <laughs> I still write occasionally, but I once wrote a poem that said, I am a revolutionary without any revolutions left to fight. Well, that was wrong because there is still a big revolution to fight in this country. And although we have all overcome the invisible lines of racism, they are now front and center in everybody's face. Yeah. So what is the burning platform mm -hmm. to get people to move, to get businesses to move together, to get people to do exactly as Corey said, put it on your, on your dashboard. It's on our dashboard at American Family. We want a diverse workforce that looks like the people that we serve. So what do we need to do today to make that happen? We want our white brothers and sisters and allies to actually do as I've done this morning. So we've been we've had a lot of content created at American Family in the last several days about what it is to be me or to be Tyler Whipple or to be um, uh, Candy Embry. All of those are executives of color at American Family and, and, and several others. And that content, one of which was a podcast this morning, that podcast was released. And I have no less than 20 emails from my white brothers and sisters said, I am thankful that you told me this story. Now to do that, I had to let down some, some of my guard at the same time, because we don't tell these stories. I don't know. Um, we had two African-American, three African-American leaders at our company come clean and tell the people that they've been on the other side of, of, of a police gun, or they've been uh, uh, harassed and thrown in jail they don't have criminal records because they obviously weren't doing anything wrong, but they've been on the other side of that. Those are not things that we talk about as black people. You know that we don't talk about those things. We're told to keep our back straight, our lips, uh, our lips from shivering and go do your job and outwork. Well, you can't outwork this problem anymore. Yeah. And so what is it? So what, it, what, what keeps me up is how do you do that in mass mm -hmm. so that the problem of race in America Lots of people say our original sin will not be solved by black people. Mm -hmm. It takes some white folks yeah. to say, I don't want this for my children either. Yeah. It takes some people who may be white, but also love some people that look like us yeah. or care about people that look like us to say, I don't want that for my children's future. So I want to cut you off. Uh, for those who we got about 2000 people between the different platforms that's tuning in. You just said something very, very powerful. And I want to hear um, your comments to see if you agree with what Talisa just said. Will this issue be resolved? Uh, was it by white people uh, supporting this movement and would love to uh, hear uh, folks speak up about that? I'm also hearing Talisa, and I want to ask you to start first. Uh, people, uh, at least the three or four different platforms that I'm looking at, the question of spirituality came up. And one particular question I would ask if you all could quickly um, answer, but one individual saying many of the guests on the program today have talked about their spirituality and church involvement. To that end, how do you make decisions to contribute to churches or to religious organizations 
In other words, what do you do around giving? So for me, so I'm, I am a person of faith. And, um, and I, I'm a Christian, I want to say that out loud, because I don't want to um, have anybody mistake that from some, for something other than what it is. Um, I, I personally believe you give a, a full 10% at least, and you give it to where it can make the most impact. Mm -hmm. So I, I do believe that the church has been the background for our movements up till now. Um, I do know that in Madison, um, um, the churches are getting together to do a, a silent, peaceful march over the weekend. Um, pastor Everett Mitchell, who happens to be my pastor, is going to be a big part of that, along with a, lo a lot of other people. Um, so I'm not really sure what the what the qu what the question is really about. Is it about do we give to churches? Yes, we should, but we should give also to every other place that's going to make an impact. And to whom much is given, as Corey said, much is required. And, and so it is not just on the uh, out of the pocketbooks of the people who ha may have more than others, but every last one of us need to be given what we can give in order to advance the cause. And somewhat, some of the cause, some of what you give is time, effort, and energy. And some of what you give is time, effort, and energy to help another person um, to climb up a ladder or to get out of a situation that they happen to find themselves in. I'm not sure I'm ans answering the question, um, but that is my response to it. Spot on. Spot on. Cedric? So I was raised, you know, just, just as many of you um, in the church. I do not um, go to church now. Um, I do not uh, participate um, on, a, on a number of, for a number of reasons, mm -hmm. um, which we don't, we don't have time to, to, mm -hmm. to unwrap. Um, and Salisa was ready for you. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a bad way, because it's a personal decision. No doubt, no doubt. So. Um, and, and I'll say this, you know, when, when I give, um, you know, I, I live my truth, I own my truth. Um, I want to make sure that um, I am giving to organizations that are actually uplifting the whole person, um, that are that is not necessarily participating in what I see as judgment, um, that is really about uh, you know, what are we doing for the good of society? And I'm not saying the churches don't, but um, I think that I, I, I just think about it in a, in a broader way. Yeah, um, um, I, a lot of my values are based in Christianity. However, um, today um, I, I've chosen in a conscious sort of way how to give, how to have impact void of belonging to a church. That's not to say I don't live a Christian-like life, um, but there, it's, it's way more complicated. No doubt, it's a respect that. How about you, Corey? Uh, yeah, definitely, you know, Christian, saved, grandmama's church, which I have to stay in till long after grandmama's gone, even though, you know, it was a little bit too conservative for my wife. So she's gone to a church that kind of grew out of our church. Uh, I got a stack of envelopes down here near my knee from my pastor. And even though things have gone virtual, he still expect me to mail that check in. So <laughs> I mail that check in and, and they get it. And he sends me a little text message telling me that he's picked my check up. And I see it clear within minutes of when he's texted me. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all about that. And, um, you know, and not only because it's who I was raised, um, you know, I, I feel very strongly about making a difference between a distinction between spirituality and religion. And a lot of people get caught up in religion and in stuff and in process and all that. And I'm not in any of that. I don't care about any of that. But I do care about spirituality. And when I look at the stress that I'm under every day in my normal life, not to mention COVID, not to mention the current crisis, it's that spirituality that helps me kind of get through all of this craziness. But also, um, you know, I, I really believe in you know, the life that Christ led as a revolutionary, as a change agent. And so much of what I try to model in my life is that same kind of, you know, revolutionary change agent kind of every day. How do you interact with people, including people who don't mean you well, as they clearly did not mean him well. So this whole conversation about social justice for me 
you know, it has to have some strong moral underpinning. And whether that's in Christi- uh, Christianity or in Hinduism or Buddhism or in whatever your ism is, you've got no ism at all. You know, this is a moral point. Yeah, there's economic implications to it. But this is about a more this is a morality issue. This is a human rights issue. It's a civil rights issue. So the spirituality matters to me, not in a religiosity kind of way, because religion has turned, has run a whole bunch of people away from being spiritual. So I'm not into that at all. But I am into, you know, the spirituality side. And it's how I get through the day. It's how I wake up. It's how I pray through the day. It's how I end my day. Because otherwise, I, I know I, I could not other than I. That, um, that are affecting this. And you know, at the end of the day, I know God got this. And I'm just trying to do my little bit to help as he ascribes it to me and then have him say that I did my little bit in a way that was well done. So that's how I think about the whole thing. Be mindful that it is about the shared humanity. Yes. And, you know, uh, you know Angela, and I are, uh, Angela Russell and I are really close and I think she wouldn't mind if I say this. Angela has it tattooed on her arm and is constantly reminding all of us that white folks see that we are human too. Because let's let's be real candid. Uh, Before, during slavery, we were property. We were not human. So let's put that in the context. You cannot value property over human. So understanding the implications of that shared humanity is of most importance. Mm. Now, I one, I know there's some viewers right now, like how do they get on faith and religion, all that's making change in the black community. You can't deny it going back to slavery. You can't deny how how implement how important the black church has been. So this is not a surprise to me, but from some of our white allies, I might be surprised to hear about that. But I just want to make sure that you understand this is what they're saying is not abnormal. Can Most, I say one thing, Henry? Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, I would say the Black church has been instrumental in all of this uh, in our history. Yep. But more than the church to get to the issue of religion um, is the faith. Um, yep. So, And so um, I, I think it's important to say there are things that kick American men on this call. And I know that when you see blue lights behind you, you do not feel the same way that... Um, one of my great, great friends um, who's watching this might actually feel because a woman and being part of this group of people who through everything created culture, um, we set standards. Um, everybody wants to be like us. There's a song from Sounds of Black that said, everybody wants to be, be like us, but nobody wants to sing our song. And I think we're at a moment where faith and humanity merge around this notion that actually there are some people who are willing to pick up the burden for us. There are some people, you see it in all these kids marching. These marches that you see that are peaceful. Uh, my favorite one was out in Denver where they sort of laid on the ground for uh, that amount of time. Um, and th- most of those people were called get involved in this beyond what I can do um, as a member of my corporate team. When you choose to get involved in this, you are actually choosing to protect your soul and quite frankly, the soul of this country. Oh. And and so I think it's important for us to not only if we could have gotten to this point, we will get to the next point because many people would not be able to overcome what our ancestors have been able to overcome. Mm. And I think that there's a shared responsibility um, between people of color and people who of privilege. Um, so to use their privilege for good to save the soul of this country, quite frankly. I think it's, I think it is a burning platform for us now. This is not who we are. We are not, things don't happen in America that people around the country have to go march for, around the world. So generally speaking, we march to the principle or the highest ideas of who America is. Well, now there are people marching in other continents and other countries because of what's happening here in America. Mm -hmm. I thank those people, I applaud those people. And I'm just asking us as corporate citizens, as people in general, as people of faith, whatever your faith happens to be, as people are part of the human human race, that we actually repay that favor and do what's right and make um, radical change. Mm -hmm. And radical change calls for people more than us 
to stand up and say, we won't take this. Ask some questions. So let me ask a question. This was actually to you, Corey, but all of you can answer. But I'll start with you, Corey. How do we as a white business community, uh, how do how do we as a white business people in the community offer that help Corey is talking about without coming off across as patronizing to people within our companies when we're recruiting and also to others out in the community? Did you get that? Uh, yeah, I think I got the I got the gist of it, you know, especially the bit about, about without coming off as patronizing. I guess I, the first thing I'd say is don't worry about that. You know, we have much bigger things to be worried about than getting offended that, you know, you're being patronizing. I mean, there's so many allies of good faith and of goodwill that we got to get past all this stuff on language and dancing and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I, I would say that uh, to our white allies is that if you're concerned about messaging and tone, I hope you got some, you know, some black and brown people in your sphere who you can run the messaging and the tone by and not just one. Right. Because I, Corey, I'm not a representative of all of us, uh, but I can give you a perspective and an ear. So I would I would run it by them. But ultimately, you got to get past your concern about how your offer of assistance will be perceived. Uh, and you just got to push past that. And then you got to go do it. And you got to decide that you're going to commit. Uh, your organizational resources to doing something. And don't try to boil the ocean. Pick your one or two things and just say, we're going to stay like a dog on a bone with this. If it's about hiring, if it's about wage disparities, uh, whatever, whatever, your thing, whatever your thing is, and then just make that your organizational priority. And then Marshall, you know, tone at the top will matter as the CEO or the executive say, this is our issue. This is our platform. This is our thing. And we're going to stay behind this and we're going to commit our resources to it. There's lots of other things we could do, but this is the one thing that we've chosen. Uh, and then to be working as an ally with the other people within your organization to advance that. And, you know, the bit of it that's a challenge for me, and I know both Talisa and Cedric struggle with this as well, is, you know, who ought to bear the burden of this? Right. So, you know, I get the black tax. Right. And I sort of accepted that that's part of the deal. But, you know, this change cannot be born on the back of black people. We didn't create this problem. It's not our problem to fix or solve. So don't 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 yoke, you know, your black people with trying to fix this. We have an important role and voice to play in the conversation. Uh, but be careful about overly burdening and taxing, you know, the people of color in your organization uh, to help manage this. And that, that's tough because I don't want these folks going off half cocked down the wrong path but I don't want it to be my problem to solve either because the level of resources around it, the level of commitment around it, the moral authority around it. If it's black and brown people, of course we believe in it. It's like mom and apple pie for us, but we got to get our allies to really take tip of the spear and then we can help support, direct, inform, nuance, shape it, but they got to own it and drive. Yeah. yeah. Same question for you, Cedric. So well said. Um, I, you know, one of the things that uh, I'm hoping, um, just as Corey just um, articulated, you know, I, I'm not I'm not going to get offended by what you might be concerned about. Might look like you're, you're patronizing, but as long as you've got some voices at the table, you're reaching into um, folks who look like me, um, and that it's genuine. So, how do you have it become a part of the fabric? of what your company is, of who you are as an organization. Um, you cannot um, see it as this little side gig. You know, how do you make it a part of the fabric of who you are? Because, you know, all boats rise, right? So how do you do that in a way in which is, is absolutely inclusive and sustainable? So, what, about, what, what about you, Talisa? I think I answered it first, but um, um, I, I think I answered it already. Yeah, I don't know you did. Yeah. Is. <laughs> hey, hey, you, you mind if I jump in? There was a question uh, about capitalism on social media, you know, and given the roles that uh, each of you all play, um, somebody asked, do you think capitalism is systemically part of the problem with racism and the broader uh, inequalities in the United States? I'm shaking my head. No, I don't know any other answer. And Corey might want to have a, you know, he's a private equity guy, so he might be able to have a more profound, profound answer. I would say no. And I would say the fact that the fact that we, we live in a capitalist country uh, um, actually has helped 
along the journey as you think about people pay for what they what they want. And if you think about how our people, um, black and brown people everywhere have moved up economically, it's about providing value to somebody else. Um, but that can't be the only answer. So once you've got the system there, you've also got to not only have the companies, the the leagues, the, you know, you think about the NBA, the NFL, the Major League Baseball Association, our entertainment system, our broad media system, all these places where um, black and brown people have outsized um, economic advancement um, are really important. But then it's also about these other places because not everybody can participate in, the, in those uh, places. So to the NFL, um, and I love the league, it's great that you are paying a lot of uh, the players on the field. You know, as we go back to numbers, at what point do you also have representation in your offices? Because it's capitalism and opportunity together. And that's my philosophy, but I could be um, not as smart about it as Corey, who spends his days thinking about it, I'm sure. Well, I, I know your husband, Talisa, is smart enough to know that you're always right. I learned that message not early enough in my marriage, but I did learn it eventually. So I, I agree with you entirely. And I'm a rabid, unapologetic capitalist. Having said that, it, it's not a perfect system, right? And um, we got to remember that capitalists are people too. And underlying these isms are real people with real biases. I have my biases and blind spots. So we have to acknowledge that this ism though I think it is the greatest economic system in the world, and I've looked at systems all around the world, I think it's the best one, but it has its imperfections. And it's our responsibility to address its imperfections so that everyone has an equal opportunity to be successful within that system. We're not there yet, but that's our responsibility. Man, you all are so bright and talented. Like, for all the people watching this, like, there is some talented Black folks in this state. And just listening to you all, has just been good for my soul uh, this morning. So I just want to say personally, as somebody that's helping to host this morning, we honor you, we thank you, and just appreciate everything that you all are doing to you know, educate folks who are watching this morning. All right, Henry, you got the next question? Well, before you go, no, Cedric, Cedric, let uh, Cedric answer. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. So I have a little bit of a different take. All right. Um, I am a true capitalist, however, we cannot forget history. So if you think about this system that is flawed and how wealth has been created, go back 400 years ago. And I, you know what? And, and a lot of folks get all crazy when, when they hear folks talk about wealth and the distribution of wealth. And I'm not talking about redistributing wealth, but I am being really clear about understand the origins of that wealth and that that wealth if it happened on the backs of black and brown folks then obviously something you got to do something there in terms of how do you pay that forward to create more equity i want to make sure that um justice corey just said um that in terms of creating that level playing field um, to create a, more of an equal opportunity for all of us to share in this flawed system, um, then by all means, I, I don't think that capitalism is the problem, but I, we cannot forget um, that, that poison pill that came with it um, because my ancestors um, contributed greatly um, against their will uh, to help other folks get wealthy under this capitalist system. Um, so I want to make sure that we're that we continue to push up against the capitalist system to make sure that it's giving opportunity for all. That's good. And uh, to so acknowledge that there are modern day benefactors of that legacy. Right. So I talked to some of my white allies and they say, well, I didn't do it, but you are the, the modern day beneficiary of that, that legacy that got created. And we can move beyond, this isn't about blame, this is about a recognition of people starting out at very different places, mm -hmm. which then affects often, too often, where we end up, because mm -hmm. we can't make up that gap fast, fast enough. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think we got to continue to come back to, I think your points are spot on, Cedric, about 
kind of uh, what, what, what the lingering vestiges of, of that racist legacy is, particularly as it relates to wealth disparities. Yeah. Mm. And, you, and you can't help but think a little bit about, think about healthcare. Mm. The fact that that is, and I work for one of those companies, you know, health insurance, you have to pay for it. So, I mean, there's something wrong with that. Um, and it has unique implications on people who look like me. I mean, those health disparities have a lot to do with economics and access to healthcare insurance. So I don't wanna be, I don't want us to miss that point that I do think that there's opportunity for us to fix this broken system. Thank you, thank you for that. So uh, this is an interesting question. <laughs> uh, I've heard people talk about code switching in the workplace. What would a change in the workforce, uh, what would the workforce do to eliminate the need to code switch look like? How do we need to change workforce culture to be more inclusive of all kinds of people? Uh, you all are kind of smiling. Who wants to take that one? I'm not gonna pick on anyone this one. Who wants to take it? I will start because okay. as you can see, I've been on COVID lockdown <laughs> and my hair looks like this. And so, it's not a little bad. I don't think the other looks good. Yeah, it looks good. I, think, I appreciate that. But the question becomes, could I have done this earlier in my career at a different level in my career without having to ask a lot of questions, answer a lot of questions? So I'll tell you a story. Um, several years ago, when I was four years old with another company, um, I um, decided that I was going to stop. I had tried to put perm in my hair. We all know what that is on, on this line to straighten my hair and it did not go well because it, it, it really shouldn't, doesn't need any perm. And so I needed to cut it all off and start over. And um, I talked to some exec, some older and higher up in the company, uh, people of color to say, I need to cut my hair off in order to um, give it a chance to re get healthy and grow back. And they said, no, it will ruin your career. Wow. Wow. Because if I cut it off, I can't straighten it. And I already know I'm, I shouldn't use any of those chemicals in my hair. And I had done so at a, at a very late age. My mother never allowed us to. And it turns out she was right about that. Now, um, so I waited and got my performance review. And after my performance review came back and said that everything was great, I went home and cut my hair off. And um, and my white allies didn't think anything of it. And I specifically, but I specifically, you know, tried to follow the pattern of explaining it um, that I think I learned from years of studying and admiring the, the 60s civil rights movement. Because again, remember I said I wanted to be a revolutionary, but I didn't have a revolution. I went into my boss's office and said, hey, by the way, I, I, I'm cutting my hair off and it may not look the same, but I'm still the same person. He was like, what are you talking about? So he wasn't concerned about it as the white guy, but all of my um, black and brown friends were like, girl, your career is going to be over. And it wasn't. And so that's one small example of how we feel like we have to be, and this again is give, it, give yourself some grace. Um, we are not in the same space that I was when I started my career 25 years ago. Um, what people believe is an acceptable black person um, has changed at least physically, you know, um, some of our best um, um, icons for what it is to look or be an African American person or a brown person in this country are not, they're not, they have not been um, spending a lot of time making themselves look other than black. But the real issue on code switching is can I have the same conversations that I have um, with you guys on this call and all of our close friends that are watching with my coworkers and friends. Do I have to swallow some things or do as Cedric would say and just lay it all out there on the line and have a real serious conversation? So I do believe that it still exists, but I also think that there are ways to find courage to speak up. And part of that courage has to come from us. And again, who bears the burden? I have never been in a more powerful meeting than the ones I was in earlier this week. And I was there as a participant listening to my coworkers that are executives at American Family who happen to be um, black and some of them are not black, they are Indian 
of Indian descent, but they are dark enough that they can be confused for Black. And so those people telling their stories to their allies across the way on the screen and watching the body language of those other people who just don't know. So if, I, if you don't know that you are causing me to code switch, then is it you or me? And, mm -hmm. and we are now at a time where we have to take some risk, as Corey would say, and not try to walk the middle of the line. But you've got to, we, we have to, and I've learned this myself, that the more authentic we can be with grace, because I don't think, as, as Cedric said, it ain't somebody else's fault that um, we have this system that was done on the backs of our ancestors that created all this wealth in this country. That's not anybody that's living right now's fault. Um, so I don't, I don't need to make anybody feel guilty. That doesn't help. Mm -hmm. I do want people to be aware because perhaps they can help. So if you can speak up, if you're in our position to speak up to say, hey, that's not acceptable for you to assume that so-and-so is not as polished because they've got braids in their hair or because you think they speak with, they, they have not mastered the American English language the way that you think that they should master it, but they still have great brilliance. That's my job to speak up. But for those other people that are present, you know, engage in the dialogue and have the conversation. I don't think that we have any more time left to try to code switch. Hey guys, real quick, I got a couple of uh, TV stations texting me, asking if you all, any any of the three of you would be willing to do an interview uh, afterwards. If so, if you could just type in the contact information on the chat line, there's a few stations that want to talk to you all afterwards. I nominate to Lisa. With my son, I'm not, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not nominating me. And, and they're doing, they're saying, they're telling last me. Last day of school, and I have got to go get on a, the school bell ringing uh, thing with my son as soon as this is over. So, so Cedric, Cedric's the one. Um, uh, yeah, sure. So, <laughs> okay, can we, let's go back well, to this code switching question because I think it's important. I think this yeah, is a so really important too. question. Yeah. So, so I want to, um, I want to say this that we've got to be mindful um, that white supremacy is built into all of our systems. Um, how we speak, how we show up, you know, what's appropriate for measurement, you know, what's what's acceptable from a presentation. Um, so I have to say this, that I want us to be mindful that that still exists. And until we begin to really dismantle it, um, it'll constantly, there's, there'll constantly be a need to code switch. Um, I try to do it less, but I'm not 100%. I mean, every now and then, um, in order to kind of, you got to meet people where they are, sometimes that requires that you code switch. Um, but I, I want to constantly challenge um, the structural implications to white supremacy as it impacts, you know, how we look at people. What do we consider the standard of excellence? Um, I, I think that we've got to really um, talk about how those things show up. Um, and, you know, as Talisa just said, how do we give ourselves grace? How do we help other people understand that in order to be more inclusive um, and once you build a really inclusive culture, there's, there, there's less of a need for code switching. But the, the, the fact of the matter is based on those things that exist in our society, I think there still is a need to code switch. Yeah. Well, Corey, I'm, I'm really interested in you answering this, Corey, because like I started this off, uh, you were Secretary of Commerce, and literally, you and I used to be the only Black guys in a lot of rooms. Uh, so I'm curious, how, how do you see this? So I, you know, Talisa had, a, had, a, Talisa had alluded to this. I don't think code switching is the issue. Um, every community code switches. I've got friends of every background and ethnic, and I can tell you the com the language that they use at their kitchen table. I've then gone into a business environment with them, and the language is very different. So every ethnic group, we're a nation of immigrants, and I assure you, if you're an Italian or Irish or Black, everybody's code switching. So code switching isn't the issue for me. The issue for me, and Talisa really nailed this, is can you show up in your workplace and be your authentic self? 
right? And Or do you have to be wearing this double mask where you have to kind of come in and be somebody other than who you are in terms of how you interact with the workplace? And my job as a leader is to broaden the aperture about what success looks like uh, and what it sounds like and how it shows up in such a way that people who may look very different than I do and sound very different than I do and have very different bios than I do still can sit at the table and bring their intellectual capital to that conversation. So I don't have a problem with the code switching as long as people can be authentic in who and what they are and if the organization can get the benefit of, of the intellectual value that they bring. So that's, you know, so I'm not bothered by it in that way. So we got, we got 10 minutes, le 10 minutes left. And um, another question I thought was really good. How do you encourage all of your employees to be better allies to your uh, black employees uh, in the workplace? You know, for me, the most important thing you can do, and so I'm in financial services, white male bastion, right? I think the most important thing I can do is to is to call out examples of, of, of microaggressions, of unintentional acts of inconsideration, so that people see it. Because so much of this is stuff that, you know, I call them diversity blind spots. We all have them. And people, depending upon your lived experiences, you may or may not appreciate it. So who gets invited to lunch? Who gets to have the conversation at the water cooler? Who gets to work on which cases and which assignments and at what levels and in what roles? So, so much of my responsibility is to really challenge, you know, our thinking and our behavior around who gets picked, who gets chosen, who gets included, and kind of what that looks like. Because I think people's natural inclination, and I battle this myself, is to find, recruit, retain, promote, develop people who look by and large like themselves. Right. So I understand that as a as a natural inclination. So part of my job is to push people beyond what I think is their natural inclination and to look more closely at that candidate who didn't come from the particular school, who didn't play rugby or golf or whatever the right thing is. So my, my job in my organization is to be challenging and calling it out in real time, not only on racial grounds, but I've had to do it on gender grounds. I've had to do it on lifestyle grounds. And I have my own biases, right? So it's 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 class based, you know. And all the guys go out to lunch, but the office manager, secretary, whose woman gets left behind. And I say to her, "Well, why didn't you come?" And she said, "Because you guys didn't invite me." I said, "I won't make that mistake again, right?" So that's the opportunity, you know, particularly as a leader. How about you, Cedric? You're on mute. You're on mute, Cedric. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. So I think that. Um, it's beyond, um, you know, you can call yourself an ally because you, um, you, you might make a post on social media. Um, you might have, a, you know, a couple of black friends or a couple of people who don't necessarily look like you. But it is really about what are you doing to challenge that status quo? I mean, just as Corey said, you know, how do we uh, think about people that don't necessarily look like us, you know, has that same pedigree, you know, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it, it is about, you know, really uh, moving to action. What are you doing um, uh, to, to enable folks um, to show up in an authentic way? Um, so so I, just, I just challenge folks to really move beyond um, the superficial things that exist around being an ally, but what are you doing um, to disrupt the system, to create a more level playing field, to make sure that you, you challenge things that look like white supremacy. Um, I think that that's what I, that's what I would look for from, from, from our allies. Um, let me ask, I have a question here that's actually a good one. So as black leaders moving forward, uh, facing your roles, do you feel extra weight in your role at this moment? And how are you giving yourself space during this time and what are you doing to keep yourself healthy? That's one question from someone. Um, uh, yeah, I'm gonna keep it real. Um, absolutely, I feel uh, um, an extra burden at this time. Um, I try to disconnect, but the fact of the matter is I cannot disconnect from being black. Um, I try to 
create space where at least I can catch my breath. But I also think it's incredibly important that my voice is, is in specific places. I mean, Henry, even when you called me to ask me to do this, I was like, <laughs> you did too. <laughs> uh, well, and I'm not, I'm not a fan of public speaking. I just, yeah. I'm not, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, but I, but I feel it's really important if I'm really about what are we doing to improve, not just get a mutual, improve where we are at this point in time and have it be sustainable. My voice needs to be there. Um, I can't rest right now. Um, but trust me, uh, you know, nobody knows how to travel better than me. <laughs> um, I get it in when I, when I have to, and once we can travel once again, I'll do that again. Um, but it is, a, it is more important for me to have impact now than to rest. Yeah. T Talisa, did you hear the question? I did not. I had to run and get my son on yeah. his yeah. last day of school ceremony. Yeah. Homeschooling is real, for real. Um, so here's the question. As a black leader forward facing your roles, do you feel extra weight in your role at this moment? And how are you giving yourself space during this time? What are you doing to keep yourself healthy? Mm, that's a good question. So yes, I feel extra burden at this time, probably more than I ever have in my entire career. Um, and again, as I said, I grew up thinking that we were the benefactors of all the hard work that was done in the 60s and as long as we could work hard and do whatever, we would we would make those people really proud for what they had done for us. I never could have imagined that we'd be here. What I do is I have a great community of women, um, African-American women that I um, uh, hang out with. They're my Jack and Jill sisters, mostly. We ride every morning on Peloton. One of them is um, a physician and brilliant about sort of getting you to realize how all these things impact your body. So um, I try very, so I just yesterday hit my 60 day streak of riding every day on Peloton, Peloton wow. um, after, and I've already, thank you very much. And I'm close to 200 rides now, but um, but I, I, I think more than ever, as someone said it earlier, that the legacy of race in our country um, didn't just go away, even, it, even when, um, slavery was over and the 60s happened and today happens or what have you, the legacy of race actually, I believe, resides in our DNA and it impacts how we um, process stress and our blood pressure and whether or not we're going to be people with diabetes and those things. So I think that part of doing the work is taking care of yourself first. Um, I need to continuously do that, but my company of sisters um, who are my Jack and Jill mothers are they have been phenomenal. I have a very close family system and my sisters, my actual physical sisters are wonderful. One of them is probably thinking right now she's never coached switched in her life and she don't intend to do so because um, <laughs> she, she just doesn't. Um, my sister in Chicago and she's a great, very successful person. So, and my husband and my family, I, I have the great privilege of having my mother to live with us. So um, I think you can endure anything with family, faith, and um, actually giving yourself space to laugh about it at sometimes and to be honest about it. So the relief for me lately has been um, actually talking to people about it um, versus just keeping it inside. And as, as you said at the beginning, what we talk about when we're not in the, in, in the company of our friends um, is a different conversation. But being able to bring your friends into the discourse that you have often, I think, takes a level of stress off of you that um, you can't, and when we can travel again, we will too, Cedric. Yeah. I don't know how long it's going to take my mama to get on another cruise ship, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how many days of Peloton you said? Sixty. Um, so since we've been off, I wanted to hit the sixty-day mark. So we've been home long enough for me, and I had started before that, but I was trying to catch up with Dr. McCabe Boatwright, um, who every time I get on, she's hitting some new milestone, and or Monica Mitchell is my my other partner on the bike, and they're both like beasts, basically. That's awesome. Um, so I just yesterday, I didn't even know I was hitting it. Um, had sixty days straight, so. Wow. And I should be coming up on 200 rides again here. Awesome. Thank you. Very awesome. 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 And what and what about you, Corey? What do you what do you how would you answer that question? 
in, in the interest of time, I'm just say ditto. I don't. I mean, they, they, they both nailed it. They nailed okay. It. All right. So, well, hey, thank you. Let's yeah. you take it from Jay. Let me, uh, Cedric, Talisa, Corey. Thank you, you all, our Trailblazers. Uh, thanks for coming on. For those who are tuning in, uh, we'll be right back at twelve fifteen. Uh, we have an, an amazing third panel that will be joining us to talk about criminal, uh, the criminal justice reform. But also, we're going to talk about community building. Uh, Freedom Inc. Co-Executive Director M. Adams will be joining us. Dane County Judge and Reverend uh, Everett Mitchell. Foster founder uh, Jacqueline Hunt. Madison, former police chief, uh, Noble Ray. And then Hill the Hood founder out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, my man, uh, Ojama Butler. We'll be back in about 15 minutes. So, hey, thank you, Corey. Seriously, thank you, Talisa. Thank you, Cedric. This is a blessing. I enjoyed this so much. And I hope y'all y'all dropped a lot of stuff for people to be paying for. So thank you right. for doing this, and thank you for joining us. And hope everyone appreciates it. We'll see you next time. Seriously. Thanks thank for you. the invite. Thanks, thank you. Y'all.